Okay, so I get why Glimmer will be going to the All Princess Prom, but why did Adora get an invite to this? Sure, Angela did declare as she the Princess of Power, but is that it? You just need a title and perhaps some magic powers and suddenly Adora is a princess and gets invited to this ancient ball? I'm going with Perfuma. What? I'm gonna get to the drama between Bo and Glimmer later, just give me a minute. So Adora is going to this thing because they need more princesses for the Alliance. And the host Frosta would be a good asset because she's got the second largest kingdom around. Yet it's clear from the episode's start that Adora feels like she's about to enter uncharted waters, and it's understandable as to why. She didn't even know what parties were until Faymor. Now she's got to go to this formal thing with a ton of ancient rules and etiquette. So Adora, out of her league here, decides to fall back on what she's learned from the Horde. Rigorous training and planning. Setting the invite, I think advanced prep will be key to success. Just look at that board she's got, treating this all like a military operation. Adora is taking this seriously and trying to do what she can to prepare for something that is out of her depth. I'm the ballroom into quadrants and I'm familiarizing myself with the targets. Ask me anything. It's characterization like this that I enjoy watching viewers. Also, I made an obstacle course. <laughs> I mean, how does an obstacle course possibly assist Adora in learning how to dance, dress, or behave at a formal ball? It doesn't. Yet she made one anyway because it's what she knows and understands and helps her feel more prepared and in control even if it didn't do anything practical. This is further exemplified when Glimmer tells Adora she can't just go as she to the ball. And that's a weird place to put that too because of a no weapons rule. And there's this little montage of Glim trying to find her address yet Adora keeps looking uncomfortable and going back to her board to try and focus on again what she understands. Then eventually she just goes with this simple two-piece thing, probably because it's just simplistic. Yet here, she still has this half-nervous look to her. Adora is treating this whole event as just a mission, unlike Glimmer and Bo, who is partially a mission, partially we're gonna go have fun at this thing. And it's understandable as to why. I mean, you saw her last episode. She can't not be on a mission. Jumping over to the Fright Zone, we've got Cat for dealing with some problems here. Kodak finds out she's disobeying him, she'll take us down with her. Time for someone new to take over. She's looking out to replace Shadow Weaver without making that abundantly clear to the woman. She's actually pretty clever, reckless still, but clever enough to see an opportunity to accomplish this goal and seize it. When Scorpio pulls out a scroll for Princess Prom, that she happened to just bring with her into Catra's room. I'm a princess. You're a princess? Some lore organically given here when Scorpia mentions the Horde quote-unquote crash landed in the Fright Zone. We can piece together she means outer space as, I mean, where else would they crash land from? And that would explain the reason for the Horde's technological gap between the rest of Etheria. But back to Katra, she may have a clever side that we'll see here, but there's also this. I mean, it's covered in Force Captain orientation. I'm beginning to think I shouldn't have skipped that. Catra didn't skip it. She straight up didn't know such a thing existed, yet never seems to make an attempt to try and go out to another one. While we will see a more clever side to her in this episode, and she is a skilled combatant, it's brought down by some of her more lacking traits, impulsiveness for starters, and zapping a door at Thaymore instead of continuing to try to, I don't know, talk to her? and assaulting the Seagate with one boat and pretty much no plan beyond just run at it and fire. Catra didn't even know the gate was failing. Yet there are moments like in this episode where that clever side and the fact that Catra isn't just some grunt that carries out someone else's orders. This episode serves to establish the contrast between the bad traits. Without it, Catra can't really be seen as a threatening antagonist. And Catra is an antagonist. If she's not a threat, there are no stakes. If there are no stakes, then why should the audience care about what's going on? We also get more of Catra expressing her views on Adora's defection. How dare they take best friends who run off with people clearly inferior to you! Her eyes seem to slip between Adora and her new friends. How dare they abandon people just because they don't fit in with their perfect little lives! That last part feels like Catra just trying to come up with some explanation for why Adora would ever leave her. Catra blaming Glimmer and Bo for luring Adora away from her, which we as the audience know isn't true. It took Adora uh, making observations herself and not arguments from Glimmer and Bo to defect from the Horde, but Catra doesn't know that. Also, Scorpio is just too precious and nice here. Catra is being all like, Time for someone new to take over. And Scorpio is here, I'm hanging out in your room. <laughs> and barely knows Catra, yet is so willing to help. Oh, 
No one liked my family even before we joined the Horde. So they never liked your family yet they sent you, a Horde military officer, an invite to an event that only happens every decade? Anyway, Scorpia is so warm and open and that's why I mentioned some time ago that she was someone Catra really needed it and that's because Scorpia is like this. Catra had to deal with a manipulative and abusive Shadow Weaver as her only parent growing up and lost her previous crutch in Adora. So Scorpia could have been the thing she needed, and the two do seem to get along all right. If only Katra would just see that, though. She ends up trying to, well, manipulate Scorpia's insecurities about not fitting in with the other princesses to get her to go to prom. Yet I fail to see why. It seems like Scorpia would have taken Katra there if she just asked, but Katra doesn't seem to realize or understand that. One issue I do have with this show that is exemplified here is the fact that it doesn't do a good job of establishing a clear timeline. Bo ends up going with Perfuma to the ball instead of with Glimmer. It, getting to that last part in a moment. Yet he has to like head out to Plumeria to pick Perfuma up. Is there some unseen aircraft? Because everyone gets dressed then goes to Frost's kingdom. But how? Is, is it like these locations within walking distance on this continent? Also, how is anyone able to walk across this platform when it's clearly made of smooth down ice? In fact, this is basically like a tundra, yet only Frosta and her guards are wearing like actual clothing for the cold. Except for maybe this one random background character with the fur coat. Doubt we'll ever see this person again. Getting past that first act. Once at Princess Prom, Adora immediately starts messing things up. She's like 10. Yeah, Princess Frosta is young, yet hold this air of maturity around her. Reacting reserved and cold, not throwing petty insults back in front of, well, everyone, only getting that way later when Adora approaches her alone. It's a shame because this mature and more reserved Frosta will disappear after this episode, and I honestly like this character we were presented with here and wish they, I don't know, did something with it. Mentioned that she was a little kid. You did all that research! Yeah, that's a good point, Glimmer. How did Adora do all that work yet never learned Frosta's age? He was entrapped in two, no dress, no plus one, and she genuinely treats the ball as if it's just a social experiment. Form and break its like, no joking, here is how this girl sees this whole thing. The perfect place to observe behavior. More proof she's not exactly the most socially able person, especially when she asks why Bo didn't come with Glimmer. Why didn't he come with you? Aren't you two friends? Then, you know, immediately gets distracted when she notices Bo and ending the conversation in an abrupt manner. They're matching. It's our best friend thing. Okay. Let's talk about the drama here. So Glimmer never knew about Perfumer and Bo going to the ball until the beginning of this episode. And Glimmer gets snarky about it because she doesn't like how this could be the harbinger of change between them. What? Is Perfuma his new best friend now? She looks at the situation as their, well, dynamic being shaken. And she doesn't enjoy watching her friends seemingly start to break away. Being more than a little jealous and trying to make Bo feel the same way. Yet Bo is over here just trying to have a good time and he doesn't get why Glimmer is feeling this way. I mean, I get it. When you've known someone for so long and don't know how to make new friends, something that was alluded to by Cast the last episode, losing them by just drifting apart can make you feel anxious and frightened of the unknown future without them. Yet the issue I have with this is that it leaves off with Bo storming away and Glimmer crying about shoving him away. Yet after this episode, this drama shall never be brought up again nor will it be resolved, so I'm kind of curious as to why it's even here. Just to create relatable drama? Then why not try and resolve it? I mean, it starts and escalates so well with this part. I, I forgive you. Your... Glimmer says she forgives Bo for choosing to hang around Perfuma and not tell her, and feeling as if things are changing abruptly between them. And then Bo calls her out on this nonsense. I know change is scary, Glimmer, but that doesn't mean you get to take it out on me. Expertly written, but I don't like how it doesn't get resolved and it's just left as a dangling plot thread. About a winged horse that ate all the apples in Plumeria. Oh yeah, and Swift Wind is a thing that exists. Bo isn't the type to just leave all of his old friends behind and neither him. And that's a debatable quality you have, Adora. So Catra and Scorpio are here for the final act. With Adora, of course, not being born yesterday, she knows they're up to something. And it's here we see the clever side to Catra I mentioned. Knowing full well, she can't just give Adora the slip. She instead throws her off with mind games. 
suspiciously putting this note into the trash and acting like she's hanging out with Entrapto of all people. The best part is when the slow dance starts. Like, like this whole scene between them is really fun to watch and you really need to experience it for yourself. Ending it all asking where Bo is after Glimmer just said she lost track of Scorpia and Perfuma mentioned how Bo's been gone a while. Catra's got those ears and likely seriously good hearing and I'll bet she heard, heard this and said that to get a rye out of Adora. She even manages to get Lonnie and Kyle Long to steal some guard uniforms. I mean, with this large event going on, it's gonna be a hot minute before anyone notices something off about these two guards. Glimmer's fight with Bo ends up with, well, Scorpia giving her the slip so she can plant some bombs, steal Adora's sword, and then kidnap Bo, fulfilling the foreshadowing at the end of the last episode, and get captured as part of Catra's plan. Glimmer also gets nabbed, but that was just a bonus here. Having the antagonist win is such an important aspect of stories, because you need to have them be a threat, or else, well, how is the audience supposed to take them seriously? I say this because people do mess this up, and I don't get why- you think this would be simple. Make sure they win, sometimes, so that people think they're a threat. It also doesn't feel too contrived, because there is a fair amount of luck involved. Bo leaves the party to see Scorpia planting bombs, and fortunately the only guards out here are the disguised Lonnie and Kyle. Catra ends up falling off the ice castle, but Scorpia just happens to be there to catch her, and like I mentioned, getting Glimmer was mostly just a lucky bonus. It's a believable win because as clever as Catra planned this out to be, things didn't go perfectly. So it doesn't look like Kitty Cat just pulled a victory out of thin air after being shown to be reckless and impulsive one moment and suddenly perfect at crafting plans the next. Of that, I am grateful for as we get to see Catra as being competent, yet they don't have to cast away her flaws and make a situation feel contrived to do so. So that was episode 7 of Overanalyzing Shira. If you like this video and want to see more, then hit that thumbs up and the subscribe button, then bell to get notifications about the next episode. I'll try to update this series every Thursday, so please share with other fans of the show, and also check out my channel for my video essays and music analysis videos. You might find them enjoyable as well.